Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Spies. I'm the senior pastor here at Christ Church. I'm so excited to be gathered with all of you as we are coming together, even though virtually we are still coming together in spirit and in truth to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together. This morning is, a, is a, an exciting day. We have our bishop and our founding pastor, Bishop David Bryan, is going to be with us. He's going to be opening up the word and sharing with us an encouraging truth from God's word. And so welcome, David. It's good to have you with us. Well, friends, this morning, as we begin our worship, I'm reminded of Psalm 95, where the psalmist says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. And so in that spirit, let's begin our worship today. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's worship together. Rose 
reading from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in a path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it, if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to you, this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The word of the Lord. My dear friends in Christ, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, good morning, Christ Church. It is uh, so good to be with you this morning. Uh, this is a little unusual way uh, for me to be with you, but uh, we've gotten uh, used to the new normal. Uh, 
And I'm so thankful that we're able uh, through technology to continue to meet, to continue to worship, to pray together, to support and encourage one another. I've been so uh, proud of Christ Church and have been attending the the online services and having phone conversations with uh, several of you, even uh, have seen a couple of you face to face. And uh, just so thankful for your gifts and the ways that you've rallied around uh, in this very challenging season, uh, one another. Uh, one thing that hasn't paused in this crazy time in which it seems like everything has just come to a stop, the one thing that never goes away is the mission of sharing the love of Jesus, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, continuing to minister and serve in compassionate ways those in need, coming alongside uh, those uh, in government and the medical profession right now, praying for them, supporting them, uh, and encouraging uh building up the body of Christ. I'm just so thankful for Eric and Joshua and the entire team of leaders uh, at Christ Church and the ways that you guys uh, have held together and uh, continue to encourage uh, one another. Uh, I read uh, recently uh, a friend of mine who was a church planner said, well, he said, church planning prepared me to preach to empty rooms, and I can relate to that. I remember some of the very early days of Christ Church when we uh, were just beginning a handful of us, and we didn't know, are folks going to come today? Uh, and so you were prepared, and you were ready to preach to what might be a small crowd. And so here I am with uh, my camera, and I'm uh, teaching, preaching, uh, sharing with you this morning. But uh, I do have an advantage. One thing that hangs in the wall of my study uh, is your faces. And so I have the entire uh, congregation from my last Sunday at Christ Church. I'm going to put it here right by the camera so I can glance down and uh, see your faces as we uh, delve into the Word of God together. So let me invite you to pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you for this new day, that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for your promise that when two or three gather uh, in your name, even as we are gathering across uh, the internet, Lord, you are in our midst. And so we pray that you would come now through the power and person of your Holy Spirit, and that you would take the word that uh, is to be preached this day and fill it with your fullness. Bring it to life. Bring us to life, Lord Jesus, uh, that we might see you, that we might hear from you, that we might uh, in turn uh, minister in your name. For we all pray, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, today, as we've already heard, uh, our passage that I want to focus on is this uh, John 10 passage. It, uh, it begins this way, and, and it begins with truly, truly. And whenever Jesus says truly, truly, what he's about to say following those words are something very important for us to hear. Uh, this is a familiar passage. Uh, this is Good Shepherd Sunday. This is uh, the chapter of John's Gospel that deals with Jesus as our Good Shepherd. And yet there is so much depth and so much that I believe uh, the Lord has for us in it. I pray that, that God will uh, stir our hearts and help us to see new things. But Jesus begins this way. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Uh, Jesus goes on to say, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And Jesus begins with a contrast between those who come in illegitimately uh, through a uh, a side door and not the door, 
as opposed to the one who's the shepherd of the sheep, who, who enters in. And of course, what Jesus is going to do is point to himself as the good shepherd, the one who is rightfully a shepherd of the flock of God's people. And he's going to invite us into this kind of relationship, which we're, we're going to see in this passage. We want to first kind of look at the backstory. There's an immediate backstory to why Jesus says truly, truly. And he launches into this discussion of those who are thieves and robbers versus the one who is the true shepherd of the sheep. And if you go back one chapter uh, in its immediate context in John's gospel, uh, you see that Jesus uh, healed the man who was born blind. Uh, wonderful thing. Man had never seen, and Jesus ministers healing to him, and his sight is restored. Uh, and what happens? But uh, the so-called shepherds of Israel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of Israel, uh, push back. They don't rejoice that this man who is blind and now sees can see, but they reject Jesus. They refuse to believe in Jesus. They call Jesus uh, a uh, heretic, in essence, in the Jewish faith. And so uh, that's part of the context. And I believe that what Jesus is saying is folks that uh, are supposedly shepherding God's people always aren't, and that he now is the true, the true shepherd. But there's a long history of this. There's a, a bigger backstory, if you will, uh, if you go back into the Old Testament. Uh, what you see in the Old Testament is this uh, imagery of false shepherds uh, brought up several times by many of the prophets. For instance, in Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. There's a sense that there are false shepherds that are leading and scattering uh, God's people, leading them astray. Here in Ezekiel chapter 34, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel said, Son of man, Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, all shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should you not feed the sheep? And so there's this imagery that's in the, the minds of all of the people of God that, that there have been throughout the generations those who are false shepherds. And Jesus is going to hold himself up in distinct contrast to those false shepherds. Ezekiel goes on later in that 34th chapter, and God makes a promise about a shepherd. He says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. An amazing context for Jesus uh, to uh, both uh, following the healing of the man born blind, given this uh, history that Israel has, for Jesus now to come and begin to draw the contrast uh, between what it means for him to be shepherd versus those who propose or, or pose, if you will, to be shepherds. But Jesus says, no, actually, they're thieves and they're robbers. Jesus continues in this passage, John 10, verse 3, to him, that is the shepherd of the sheep, the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought them out, all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the stranger. 
You see, what Jesus is saying to us about the nature of, of his shepherding, us as God's flock and as God's people, is that one, he is the rightful shepherd because the gatekeeper opens to him. There's a, there's a, a, a sense, and this was certainly true and is true even this day in Israel and the kind of Eastern shepherding where, where sh different shepherds would have their own flocks and they would bring them together and they would actually share a pasture or they'll share a gated area together. But when the shepherd comes after his own, he has a distinct call. And even though there's thousands of sheep, if he just has 50 in his flock, his 50 will hear his voice. And they will come out from among uh, the larger group of sheep and follow their shepherd. And, and he would lead the way and they would follow behind him. And Jesus says that's the nature of, of what God is doing in him, that he's He's inviting the people of God to, to hear his voice and to follow after him. It's the nature of what it is to belong to Christ, to, to be his disciple. It's, it's uh, tuning our ears to, to know his voice. And Jesus says that's essentially the work of God's Spirit in us. When we hear the word of Christ, uh, we respond. When we see Christ lead and direct our lives, we follow. Jesus says that the shepherd has such intimate knowledge of, of us as sheep that, that though he might have hundreds of sheep, he knows them each by name. Now stop and think about that. Jesus knows you and me by name. He knows us intimately. And he calls us with his voice to, to follow him, to live in this kind of relationship. And Jesus says this is so different than, than the false shepherds because they don't follow the voice of the stranger. They don't follow after him. They flee the other direction instead. And so Jesus kind of lays this out, uh, hadn't even made the claim that he's going to make, I am the good shepherd. But he's laying out in a way that uh, the disciples are listening. But, but John says this in verse 6. He says this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus is talking about shepherds and sheep and false shepherds. And he's drawing this contrast between uh, the kind of shepherd he is and the kind of shepherds that the people of God have had to endure uh, for so many generations. And Jesus does what? He comes out again with truly, truly. In the seventh verse, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So it's interesting. Jesus is, is kind of mixing some metaphors here. He, he's going to speak of himself as being the good shepherd. But before that, he says, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. Jesus, uh, on so many occasions, and particularly in John's gospel, uh, would use this, this language, I am. It was the same language that God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. I am who I am. And Jesus was to tell the Pharisees, uh, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus making claims of his own divinity, his own sonship, his relationship with the Father. On many occasions, Jesus would say, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am resurrection and life. I am the true vine. Jesus 
made so many claims about his divinity that he, he made it clear that uh, uh, you, you, you can't kind of be on the fence. Is this, is this a, a good teacher? Is he a prophet? No, Jesus is making claims of his own divinity. And in this case, he says, I am the door. The disciples were scratching their head. He was talking about shepherds and false shepherds. And, and he, he, he really, it's as if he's saying first things first. Uh, before you can understand what's going on uh, inside the sheepfold, you need to get in. And you get in through the door. Jesus said, I am the door. It's very similar to when he said, I am the way. If you're lost, if you're not sure uh, where you belong or where you to go, uh, you need to find the door. Reminds me in the book of Revelation, the church in Laodicea, in the third chapter of John's Revelation, uh, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and answers the door, uh, at, I will come in and I will dine with him. I will fellowship with him. And so Jesus now, kind of answering the confusion of his own disciples, points to the doorway. And he said, I am the door. I'm your way into this life. I'm your way to the shepherd. I'm your way to green pasture. I'm your way to a sense of, of purpose and protection and God's provision as your good shepherd. I am, Jesus can say, the door. It's really an exclusive claim that, that Jesus is making about himself. He didn't say, I'm one door of many. He said, I am the door. And there's an exclusivity to the claims of Jesus that, that we can't escape. We can't be kind of pluralistic and, and think that kind of all religions and all thoughts lead to the, to the same place. Not with the clear teaching that Jesus gives us in instances like this in John's gospel. Peter knew that. On the other side of Pentecost, uh, when Peter and John were arrested and brought before the Jewish council in Jerusalem, Peter says, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the door. There's no other way to this salvation that God offers us, to this green pasture and this shepherd, except through Jesus. So not only is he the way, but as we enter into this life, he is the life itself. First things first, Jesus says, I am the door. But then he continues and says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And then this verse 10, we've heard this before. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus said, what's really beautiful <laughs> at least to me, and I think it's what he's trying to communicate, is the heart of the shepherd. That heart which, which pursues us. You see, because the thief comes out of what? Out of selfish gain. The thief comes to rob or steal or, or even destroy because it's not about the sheep, it's about them. But Jesus' heart is different. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. It's an amazing, amazing promise. Jesus said, I'm the kind of shepherd that breathes life into your life. You see, before Jesus, we're the walking dead. But when we enter through that door, which is Jesus, we find life itself. John's gospel began this way. He said this about Jesus. Not only was he the word of God, but in him was life. 
and the life was the light of men. John said in that first chapter, he says, from his fullness, he has given us grace upon grace. You see, Jesus is the one who bestows life. He gives our life meaning. He gives our life a, 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 a future. He gives us eternity. You see, this life is abundant life. It's eternal life. It's not just something we're waiting for, but something we step into today. As we enter through that door, which is Jesus as we live in fellowship with him, as we know that kind of intimacy where uh, we recognize his voice, we see him leading and, and we follow behind. Uh, Jesus says, you'll find pasture. All the promises of the 23rd Psalm, uh, Jesus offers to us. You see, the other theme throughout the Old Testament is uh, not only are there false shepherds out there, not only one day will God uh, provide this son of David to, to be one shepherd, but God the Father is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The 23rd Psalm starts off. The, the 80th Psalm says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, as the psalmist cries out, recognizing that God, is our shepherd. In Isaiah 40, 11, it says, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will, he will gather his lambs uh, into his arms. God's heart is to shepherd, to lead, to embrace, to guide and direct our lives, to, to, to show us in this relationship that which is life itself. That's what the good shepherd's about. That's, that's the heart of God. How, how does he give that life? Well, Jesus is to go on to say uh, in this 10th chapter that the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A generation later, the apostle Peter in his first letter says this about Jesus. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live, there it is, to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were strained like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd of your souls. You see, this image wasn't something that came and went. It remained in in Peter's mind throughout his life and throughout his ministry. And he recognizes that, that all of us, as the prophet Isaiah says, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. For the Lord has called the, caused the iniquity of us all to be, to be laid upon him, upon this suffering service, this, this shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus said, the Father has given me power to lay down my life and to take it back up. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He laid down his life on the cross of Calvary. By his wounds, we are healed. By his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, we now have this gift of life that comes in the name of Jesus. Please pray with me. Gracious Father, in this crazy season of COVID-19, with death and destruction around us, with uh, false shepherds and false hopes and, and the idols and things of this world which, which offer us life but don't deliver, we pray for the grace and movement of your Holy Spirit in us this day that we might turn our eyes on the Good Shepherd, that we might be instruments and under-shepherds ministering, serving those around us in need, even if it's a phone call to a neighbor or, or reaching out with a word of encouragement to a doctor or a nurse or someone who's serving on the front line. Lord, stir our hearts to pray 
for this world, that, that more and more would come to know that Jesus is the good shepherd. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. For God's people throughout the world, for our bishops and for other leaders, for this congregation and for all who serve Christ in his church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For medical professionals, first responders, and for all in public service, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, for the sick and suffering, for those who mourn, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the poor and oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the blessings of this life and for your abundant mercy, we say prayers of thanks to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Yeah.
Together, let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, receive this blessing. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes we set on the risen Christ. May Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Friends, go in peace.